it is it is Palm Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. It's it's a joyous day, but it's a heavy day. Joyous because the king comes riding on a donkey. Heavy because he knows what he's come to Jerusalem to do. And I mean, we celebrate on days like this. But it's heavy. The same crowd that today will lay palm branches at the feet of his donkey, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Before the week ends, that same crowd, is that the record? That same crowd will cry, crucify. It's a joyous week. It's a heavy week. Because it's a journey, the entire gospel message is this journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. But then the Palm Sunday message, or the, or the Passion Week journey, is a journey from the city gates of Jerusalem to Hosanna, to Golgotha place of the scroll, the, the place of the skull. It's a joyous week. It's a heavy week. But in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the 22nd verse, we'll discover that it's a necessary Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. There you'll find these words. It's the last line, verse number 22. Be clause. These words. And Without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. You may be seated. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I just want to preach about it is necessary. It was necessary. That word necessary. It's a, it, it, it's, it's a sobering word in the language because it doesn't mean comfortable. It doesn't mean pleasurable. It means it's just something that needs to be done. Remember, I worked as a teenager, as a janitor, one of my mentors, James Smith, who was my mother's, he was my mother's janitor. And, uh, he, he I would clean with him during the summers, and uh, there were some jobs that were just, you know, anyone who's ever done janitorial work, there's some jobs that are just downright disgusting. And I would look at James and I'd say, man, man I, I know you're not trying to make me do this. Why, why we got to do this? Let's do something else. He would just look at me and say, listen, it's got to be done. Not that it's pleasurable. Not that it's joyous, not that it's something I particularly want to do, but it's necessary. Today we're called to wrestle with this word necessary. And in our series talking about better, I need to just go on and tell you that if you really want better in your life, if you really want to, if you really want to pursue the better in your life, my brother or my sister. You're going to have to learn how to lean into and to thank God and to let your life be governed by necessary. That you you don't you don't you don't go through life 
trying to figure out what's comfortable or what's ideal or, or what you want to do. You, you, you go through life doing what's necessary. I've, 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 I've discovered some things in, in my short time of living. I've discovered that there are two kinds of people in this world uh, that, that handle necessary correctly. Uh, there are visionaries. The visionary tends to see necessary before it happens and then acts accordingly. Kind of like the guy who invested in Zoom and Grubhub before the country shut down. I, 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 I see attitudes, I, 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 I see trends, I, I, see, I see ebbs and flows. I, I put my finger in the air and got a sense of the climate and, and I, I caught and understood what's necessary and I acted accordingly. The visionary knows how to govern, how to see the necessary and govern his or her, his or her life accordingly. And my brothers and sisters, if you want to, to get better out of life, if you want better from your life, you've got to learn how to be a visionary. You, you've got to learn how to see the necessary before it happens and, and govern yourself accordingly. It, it, it's some of y'all, you all need to look through your friends list and, and see the necessary before it happens. The truth of the matter is, is it's necessary that if you're going to get better out of your life. There are some associations you might need to cut off. There are some relationships you need to end, and there are probably some connections you need to make if what better is what you want from your life. The visionary has a habit of seeing the necessary before it happens and acting accordingly. And then there is the wise. The wise knows how to look back over her life and recognize things that happened in their life, in her life, and see it as necessary, and govern herself accordingly. And instead of living in bitterness over my past faults and my past failures, my past hiccups and 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 my past regrets, I should have done this. I should have said that. I should have gone here. The wise person knows how to look back and understand that every trial I've been through was necessary. And is able to sing like 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 old Marvin when he says, I'm stronger now. I'm wiser. I'm better, much better. As a matter of fact, you'll never be a good visionary unless you know how to look back. In other words, you'll never know how to see what's necessary in front of you until you learn how to look what was necessary behind you. It was necessary. We are encouraged today to look through this text and see that the blood of Jesus, the death of Christ, was necessary. We come across this word necessary all throughout the little section we're reading. Uh, yesterday, my wife, took we took the family to Robinson Family Farm, and there, there's this helicopter that hovers over the whole farm. Today, we're going to ride the helicopter over two chapters of Hebrews and, and, and land back in verse 22 of chapter number 9. Because the very first place we see this word necessary is actually in the third chapter of chapter 8 when the Hebrew writer speaks of the high priest and he says that it is necessary that the high priest have something to bring. He says, he says this in the context of chapter number 8 where the, the whole message of chapter number 8 seems to be that because Jesus, who is the exalted and eternal high priest, ministers in the holy place of the true tent, he mediates for you and me a better, a new covenant with better promises. That's the whole message of chapter number eight, that Jesus, who is the exalted eternal high priest, we know he is exalted because of a picture that permeates, that begins in chapter 1 and permeates through the entire letter. But then we know he is the eternal high priest because of this, because of what the Hebrew writer says about him being from the line of Melchizedek, that he is not a Levitical priest. He does not come from the tribe of Judah, but he comes from the eternal priesthood of a priest who had no beginning and has no end 
Rather, he steps into eternity's stage and receives an offering from Abram and then steps back off with his line still intact that Jesus is an eternal high priest, not from a Levitical line, but, but from an eternal line. He is a priest forever, and it is this exalted and eternal high priest that mediates for you and for me a better covenant, a new covenant. He's the eternal high priest. He ministers in the holy place of the true tent. Now, chapter 8, that is his central argument, that there is this true tent. That is to say that that which was built in the wilderness, later on erected in Jerusalem, was not the true tent. The Hebrew writer wants to make the point in chapter 8 that the true tent is the eternal heavenly dwelling of God where the manifested presence of the Most High dwells eternally. That's the true tent. As a matter of fact, concerning these earthly tents and the earthly religion, these earthly priests and their earthly sacrifices, in chapter 8, the Hebrew writer will use the term copy or shadow. You know what a shadow is. Light strikes an object. That object blocks light from whatever it, the path it's on. And therefore, the, the, the light creates a shadow in the bust or the image of that original object. It's called a shadow. Then you know what a copy is. That word in the Greek, it, Greek is kupo enigma. It literally means an example or possibly a model. He, he talks about a copy. It, 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 it's a copy. The, the temple is a copy. You've seen copies before. In our life, we have a bad, we have a habit of giving immense value to copies. You fly over to Paris, and uh, you you fly over to Paris and take a tour of Louvre Castle. There in the castle, there's a museum, and behind bulletproof glass, there's a half portrait of a lady sitting her name is Lisa it was it was it was it was painted by a man named Leonardo da Vinci and they call it the Mona Lisa and the Mona Lisa is what we idolize but Lisa herself and da Vinci himself are long dead now the the, the painting that stands behind the bulletproof glass ain't nothing but a copy no the stuff that's on your postcard and stuff that's on display in museums all over the world, those are not copies of the original. They're just copies of the copy. The, the original was a woman named Lisa, and she's long dead. But we have a tendency to give immense value to copies. This is what the scripture is saying about, my brothers and sisters, the temple. The temple is not the original. The temple is just the copy. Moses is allowed to see the original as he uh, uh, communes with God atop Mount Sinai. There God gives him the law. And then when God gets ready to tell Moses what he wants his tabernacle to look like, it's as if God opens the gates of heaven and gives Moses a how I'm living tour of his dwelling place and allows Moses to see the splendor of his dwelling place and tells Moses, I want y'all to try your best to build something like that. See, the, 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 the temple that stands in, that stood in Jerusalem was not the original, it was just the copy. And the little mono, and, and, the, and the little diagrams that are, that are pictured in your Bible, those aren't copies of the original, they're just copies of the copy. You all gonna follow me for just a few minutes? Uh, 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 uh. And, so, and so here he talks about the copy and the original. That Jesus ministers in the true tent. He gives us a new covenant with better promises. A new covenant with better promises. This covenant is seen in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 31 through 34. There, Jeremiah, and it's recorded in Hebrews 4, through Jeremiah the prophet, God says, I'm going to write my law on your minds. And I'm going to put my law in your heart. But before that, he says, I'm going to make you all a new covenant. 
It ain't like, it, it's not going to be like the covenant I made with your fathers because they messed that up. But, but I'm going to make for you a new covenant. And, and that new covenant, my brothers and sisters, has three components. Now, if you're writing stuff down, this is a good place to write because Hebrews says that Jesus offers you and me a new covenant with better promises. And that better covenant, that new covenant has three promises that you and I can take to the bank. Promise number one is transformation. He says, I'm going to write my law on your heart. And I'm going to put my law on the inside of you. Ah, whenever the prophets talk about the God who's going to do something new, they always talk about a God who's going to do something to our heart. Ezekiel says that I'm going to take from you, God says to Ezekiel, I'm going to take from you that heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And, 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 and one component to the promise of, of, of the covenant that God makes to you and me is the covenant of transformation. Here's the promise. Let me put it on your lap. You place your trust in Jesus Christ, and his promise to you is that your life will never be the same. I just need one witness in the house that can testify that when I place my faith in Jesus, my life was never the same. Promise number one is transformation. Promise number two is relationship. Because the, 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 the Bible says that I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. You're going to know me. And, 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 and here, the, 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 the promise is that if you place your trust in Jesus and accept him on the basis of the new covenant he mediates for you and me, God will be your father. You'll be his child. You don't have to go to some priest to absolve you of your sins. You can get on your knees and say, Lord, it's me again. Have mercy when you're sick, you don't need 10,000 folks slapping oil on you, giving $1,000 offerings for your healing. No, all you need to say is, Lord, touch my body. Have mercy on me. When, 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 when you're lonely, when you're lonely, you don't have to make phone calls here and there to this guru and to that psychic. All you can say is, Lord, come by here and, and visit your child. He, 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 he wants a, a relationship with you wants a relationship with you. That's why I quote that him. He walks with me and he talks with me. He tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Let me hurry on. He, he, he wants to transform you. That's promise number one. He wants a relationship. He wants to be with you. That's promise number two. And then there is justification or forgiveness because what he says is I'll forget their sins. I won't remember their sins anymore. I'm going to have mercy on them, and I am going to forgive them of their sins. But let me help you real quick. It, it's, it's, it's not the kind of forgiveness that you and I use today. You do something wrong and say, excuse me, or I'm sorry, fully intending to do something like that again. Because at the, in a real sense, you probably can't help it no way. That's not the kind of forgiveness he's talking about. When, when he talks about, I'm going to forgive your sins, what he's saying is, I'm going to take your sin away. Oh, that's something different, my brothers and sisters. Do you know what that means? That, that's, that's real forgiveness that gives you real freedom. That, 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 that when you step into his forgiveness and he truly takes away your sin you don't have to be oppressed by your past you don't have to be defined by what you did you don't have to be what you did 10 years ago 20 years ago when you place your faith in Jesus on the basis of the covenant he makes with you one promise he assures you of is just as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west you are forgiven anybody in the room ever experienced that freedom anybody in the room he changed your name he walked by your side and he took your past away that's the promise of the gospel that he'll change your heart he'll walk with you and you can be forgiven. Three promises. One, one, one covenant with three promises. Three promises. Transformation, relationship, and forgiveness. 
So ends the message of chapter 8. That because Jesus, the exalted and eternal high priest, ministers in the holy place of the true tent, he mediates a new covenant with better promises. Chapter 9 opens with a picture of the temple. The holy place and the most holy place. But what ought to be reminiscent in the mind of whoever's reading the book of Hebrews with me is what the Hebrew writer says in 8 and 3. It's necessary for this high priest to bring something. Y'all going to follow me. I'm going to try to get through this sermon without running all over this sanctuary because I've, I've studied this text before and I know where it's headed. Because, because the high priest has to bring something. And so the question in the mind of the reader has to be, what does this high priest bring as he ministers in the holiest of holies, not of the Jerusalem tabernacle that, 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 that's long been destructed, but, but, but as he ministers in heaven's holiest of holies. <laughs> What does he bring? The text here, as chapter 9 opens, he gives us this picture of, of what the temple looks like, and, and he tags on it a message, and he says simply that, that the priests down here, the, the priests go into the holy place, and the high priest goes into the most holy place. But remember, the high priest needs to bring something. And what he's supposed to bring, according to the Hebrew writer, in the most holy place, he's supposed to bring blood. But most of the time, but, but the high priest, two things you need to understand is that the blood he brings is the blood, first of all, of animals. And then you have to realize the reason he brings the blood. He brings the blood, my brothers and sisters, for not only your sins, but his own sins as well. And you are going to follow me here. And then as chapter 9 opens up, he says this. He says this. The, the truth is, my brothers and sisters, the message is this. That the blood of priests does not perfect the conscience. This is the end part of that section somewhere around verse number 10. The blood of the priests does not perfect the conscience. Why? Because it's goat blood. It, it's, it's, it's lamb blood. It, it's blood that can't perfect your conscience because it ain't strong enough. And then in verse 11 through 15, Christ has entered into the most holy place. And he's entered into the true tent according to verses 11 through 15. That, that, that what the priest could not do in Jerusalem, Christ does for us in glory. He enters into the true tent and he does not bring the animal's blood. According to 11 through 15, he brings his own blood. And with his own blood, he secures our redemption. That, 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 that's an important line if, you, if you're following what he does. That when Jesus, the high priest, breaks in, he breaks in with his own blood. And his own blood secures our redemption. It's a secure redemption. Why is it secure? It's secure <laughs> because it takes place in a secure place. An eternally secure place. Not in a temple that can be destroyed. But, but in the holiest of places, it, it, it's, it's a secure redemption because it's taken place by a securing Savior. <laughs> and not by a priest who, priests who live and then die, but it takes place by an eternal Savior who is always passing through the heavens for you and me. And then it's a secure redemption because it's securely powerful blood. It isn't the blood of animals. It's not the blood of calves, goats, and bulls, but it is the precious blood of an eternally powerful Savior. 
So if my redemption is secure, that means my salvation is secure. That, that, that I am not saved based upon how good I am and how powerful I am and how, how straight I walk. I am saved based on the faithfulness of God. Anybody going to talk back to me that my salvation is secure because my Savior is secure? My, my, my salvation is, faith, is secure because my God is faithful. And, 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 and the salvation I have is an eternal salvation because it was bought by an eternal God. Any, 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 anybody glad that, that, that your salvation is eternal because it was bought by an eternal God? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pastor, how do you know that your salvation is eternal? That it was bought by an eternal God because, because, because the scripture says that he'll never pluck me out of his hand. It, 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 and, and, and I don't have to live my life worrying about every time I trip and fall. Is the Lord going to kick me out of heaven? Now, let me help some of y'all real quick. Let me help some of y'all real quick. Because there are usually two kinds of Christians that get the Bible all wrong. There are some Christians who believe on one hand that every time you sin, God takes back what he gave you. Your salvation is free, but if you mess up, I'm taking it back. No, that, that, ain't, that ain't scripture. But then let me help some of y'all others. Some of y'all think... <laughs> That because my mama kicked me in the aisle and made me get baptized, that I can live any old kind of way I want to live and still expect to go to heaven. See, one person messes up because he or she thinks that it's religion that saves you. You think that it's religion that saves you. And the truth of the matter is, my brothers and sisters, if, if you have a salvation that's contingent upon how good you are, it can't be an eternal salvation. Here's why. Because you're still using earthly blood. You're still, you're still using earthly sacrifices. It, it can't be an eternal salvation because you are still the mediator of your own salvation. Then on the other hand, if you have a salvation that lets you keep living raggedy and keep living rugged, then I have a question for you. What exactly have you been saved from? If you ain't been saved from sin, what exactly have you been saved from? If, if, if you ain't been saved from drunkenness and, and if you ain't been saved from pride, if you haven't been saved from cussing, if you haven't been saved from promiscuity, what have you been saved from? The, the truth of the matter is that a potent, powerful salvation offers you three things, transformation, forgiveness, and a relationship with the Lord. And when he does that truly in your life, he ain't taking it back. He says, I've loved you. With an everlasting love. But here, my brothers and sisters, as I hurry on, he says his own blood has secured our redemption. Christ's blood, in verses 11 through 15, Christ's blood, the power of his spirit, purifies our consciences. So we've talked about three promises, but then we got to talk about two provisions. Three things that God promises us in his new covenant. Transformation, relationship, forgiveness. But then there are two provisions through which God gives us these three promises. And those two provisions, those two means by which this covenant is enacted is his blood and his spirit. His blood to cleanse us, the power of his spirit to give us the power to live eternally with him. It is for that reason. Verses six, uh, 16 through 22 speak about Christ, a mediator, whose blood was necessary for my salvation. Christ the mediator whose blood is necessary for my salvation. And, 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 and here's what he says when he speaks about Christ the mediator. That word mediator, not only does it mean that he's the guarantor of this new covenant, but, but it means that Christ stands in this powerful paradox of priest and sacrifice, of king 
hand servant of lion and lamb. And here he says, and here he begins to make the case in verses 16 through 22 that it is Christ's blood which is a necessary component for my redemption and my inheriting of the new covenant. He uses this language of heirs. He says that a will doesn't become executed until the one who makes the will dies. He says that until the one who makes the will dies, it's not then until the, the promise or the inheritance goes to the heir. Those of you who watch the second coming to America, who watch both coming to America, understand this. The last 30 years, Hakeem has been a prince. He's been the heir to the kingdom of Zamunda. But when King Jaffe finally died, Hakeem became the king. And the whole movie, now if you ain't seen it yet, that's your fault. So yes, this is going to be a spoiler. You should have seen it by now. So I'm going to talk about it. The whole movie is about the new king trying to find a new heir. That's all I'll say about it. That's the only point I was trying to make. And, 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 and you and I understand this because God, here in the text, uh, the, the Hebrew writer says, without the death of the one making the promise, the covenant has not been enacted. And so there, it is the death of Christ that is necessary. We know this, but he makes the point that it is through bloodshed, it is through shed blood, it is through death that God enacts his covenant. We saw this with the Abrahamic covenant, that Abraham prepares his sacrifices, cuts them in half, goes to sleep, and is woken up by the fire of God passing through the sacrifices. This is God's way to establish his covenant. And here we make our way to verse number 22. Without the shedding of blood, in light of everything that we've said, the provisions, the promises, the true tent, the true holies of holies, the fact that he passes through into the holies of holies and he brings something. Now we see clearly what the Hebrew writer is getting at when he says, without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. There would be no forgiveness of sin. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that's a powerful point because we need to understand where the scripture locates the victory of our faith. Yeah, yeah, yes, there is a realized victory in his ascension and his session. That, that, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that, that, that is a securing uh, a reminder that I am victorious. Oh, there's a great victory that can be proclaimed on early Sunday morning when he busts out of the grave with all power. But, 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 and, 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 and we proclaim that Christ is the victor and we see that victory vividly at the resurrection. But I want to invite you to peer at the cross, peer at the bloody, gory cross where the master is lying and giving, is hanging and giving his life. The, the, the scripture would help you to see that our victory does not begin at the ascension. Our victory does not begin at the resurrection, but our victory begins at the cross. That, that the new covenant between God and man becomes a reality at the cross. That I have transformation and forgiveness and justification and a relationship with God at the cross. That, that I can be free because of the cross. I can be made new because of the cross. I can be forgiven because of the cross. You're looking at me like you need some examples. So I want you to look at the cross real quick. Look at that thief, not the one who told him to come down from the cross. See, see, he couldn't see it. But look at that other thief. That thief will tell you that I saw him there dying. And just before he took his last breath, I looked at him and said, Master, when you come into your kingdom. See, I couldn't wait until.
until Sunday morning because I, I wouldn't have known where to find. Master, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And you remember what Jesus says even while he's hanging on the cross. This day, I wish I had one or two Bible readers who could just celebrate with me. This day, you will be with me in paradise. You, you, you remember that centurion that after Jesus died, his, his hands still stained with Jesus' blood, his spear still gory with Jesus' entrails. He looks at the cross at a Jesus hanging there, having died for the sins of the world, and he doesn't wait until Sunday when he busts out the tomb to say what he says. But he says this even at the cross. He says, surely. Oh, that's a good Baptist word that makes us shout every time we hear it. Surely this must be the son of God. Oh, that hymn writer says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. Yeah, it's at the cross. And because it was at the cross, his blood was necessary. I'm coming to my close, but I have to tell you this, that all throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus was governed by the necessary. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus always had a habit of doing what was necessary. Even at his childhood, when he gets lost in Jerusalem, we see it even there. When he gets lost in Jerusalem, his parents look all over the city looking for him. And Jesus asked the question, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that, here it is, I must be about my father's business. Ain't about what made him comfortable. It was never about what was pleasurable. It, it was never about what was his cup of tea. It was always about what was necessary. We didn't just see it in Jesus' childhood, my brothers and sisters, but we even heard it in Jesus' preaching. Do you remember when he has this conversation with Nicodemus at nighttime and Nicodemus asked him all of these questions and Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, marvel not. You must be born again. Do I have one witness in the room? Even with his miracles, someone came to Jesus and asked who sinned that this man be born, born blind. And Jesus said, oh no, when he heals the man at the, to put, uh, at the pool of Bethesda, when he heals the man at the pool of Bethesda, he says to his disciples, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is yet day for the night cometh when no man can work. Even when it comes to our discipleship, Jesus says to his disciples, if anybody is going to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. He even knew this when he, when he would prophesy about his death. If you see in the, in the book of Mark, when Jesus tells his disciples, he says that the son of man must suffer for, and, and die and in three days rise again. But we even see this during Passion Week. Jesus is outside the, the, the gates of the city in an undefined location when he gets the news that his friend Lazarus has died. And he says that Lazarus has died. And then we catch Jesus saying, we must go to Judea. Everything in Jesus' life was guided, my brothers and sisters, not by the comfortable, not by the pleasurable, not by what I would have rather had happen in my life, but everything he did was governed by the necessity of God's will in his life. And he said, I must go to Judea. And this is the Jesus who must suffer. He must bleed and he must die. That's when the thief, that's why when the thief told him to come off the cross, he stayed hanging there for you and for me because without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. So, 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 so what's the takeaway from all of this? What's the takeaway from all of this? I'm ready to go. But, but, but one thing we ought to do is look at Jesus this week in great adoration that the one who died for us did it out of the necessity of our eternal redemption. But the other thing you and I can leave here today celebrating is this, that just as Jesus' life 
was guided by the ne by necessity, so should your and my life be guided by necessity. That just as Jesus says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is yet day, so must you and I be able to look back at our lives and say everything that took place in my life, although it wasn't pleasurable, although it wasn't what I wanted, Although it might not have made me smile, but I'm glad that I made it through and that I'm still here today. And that even though it wasn't what I wanted, I can look back and see what God did with it. And I can say, you know what? It was necessary. Do I have any folk in the room that can look back at your life and say it was necessary? Because the Bible says that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. I don't know what trials you've been through. I don't know what heartaches you had to endure. I don't know what tears you had to cry. I don't know what mistakes you had to make. But I just need somebody who can look at the cross and see all that God has brought you through see that you made it see that he brought you through and said thank God it might not have been the way I wanted it to go but now that I see what you did in the midst of it I can say it was necessary can you just take one minute and wave at your neighbor and say it was necessary. I know I had to cry through it, but it was necessary. I know it broke my heart, but it was necessary. I know tears came down my eyes, but it was necessary. And why was it necessary? Because had I not gone through it, I wouldn't have seen God as the faithful God he is in the midst of it. Because when I went through it, I was able to see him work. When I went through it, I was able to see how he rocked me in the cradle of his arms. When I went through it, I was able to see how he dried the tears from my eyes. When I went through it, I was able to see how he kept food on my table, clothes on my back, a roof over my head. He kept me in my right mind. And so although I had to cry sometime, it was necessary. Say yes. Well, can I just have you do one more thing? Wave to one more neighbor. And if that's your testimony, why don't you just tell your neighbor, neighbor, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometime. Neighbor, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometime. I lay awake at night, but that's all right because I know Jesus will fix it after a while. Say yes, yes. Hallelujah, yes. Well, I just have one question. I just have one question. I just have one question. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? Won't he walk with you? Won't he hold your hand? Won't he guide your feet? Say yes. Say yes. I know he's all right. Yes, he is. I say, yes, he is. I said, yes, he is. Can you say that back at me? Yes, he is. I don't care what storm you're going through. Yes, he is. I don't care what obstacles you got to face. Yes, he is. I don't care what the devil throws at you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Say yes. Hallelujah, yes. Hallelujah.
the next time you get happy in church, the, the next time you get happy in church and, and they look at you and tell you, listen, it don't take all that. You're doing too much. You need to sit down somewhere. You just need to look at them, tell them, you don't know what I've been through. If you knew what I've been through, you'd know that this praise is necessary. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to do it this way because it's necessary. Now, if, you, if, if he ain't done nothing for you, you just sit there. But if my feet start moving, just know it's necessary. If, if my hands go up, just know it's necessary. If, if tears come down my eyes, just, just know it's necessary. 